Well, I'll begin by thanking Kevin and Doug and the, the organizers for the opportunity to speak. It's nice to be back here. I was at CanMed, I guess a year and a half ago or something in Boston, and it was a lot smaller than this, so it's great to see the growth, the growth in the cannabis area in general. So we're switching gears from earlier talks, which were focused on, on humans and medicine and, and disease states, to the plant itself. Um, and so I've sort of tailored my talk to speak specifically about genomics. I'm not gonna talk too much about the plant other than to say, you know, this is an amazing organism that we're talking about with cannabis. It's used, um, it has been used for thousands of years, maybe going on 10,000 years by humans for very diverse purposes. So there's no other plant species I think that humans sort of access widely that are, is both a source of food and the, you know, that pile of hemp seeds that I show on the slide, a source of fiber, so there's bast fiber in the, in the stems of cannabis that is, is very, um, you know, high tensile strength and used for clothing and fish nets. And, it's, and of course, it's a medicine because that's what we're talking about here today. And by medicine, I mean, you know, it, it can actually treat disease or alleviate disease, but it's also a drug. It's a social drug. And the picture on the bottom left, which I sort of scooped off a paper that Ethan Russo um, published a while ago, is actually a, a shaman's grave from Western China. I think it's something like 2,700 years ago that this individual was was buried with a whole bunch of grave goods and something like 740 grams of dried cannabis flower. So this is a, you know, a, a plant that humans have, have already utilized, um, going back that far, for its, its chemistry, like THC and other cannabinoids. So what my lab has done um, for, for a while now is, is really focused on cannabis um, as, as a producer of unusual chemicals. So my, my trajectory as a researcher was from trying to understand cannabinoid biosynthesis, so the, the biochemical pathways by which cannabinoids are formed. Actually, I'll go back one. And that led more and more to be involved in genomics. And in, in 2011, I was part of a, a Canadian team that published the first cannabis genome. It was actually the first medicinal plant for which a genome was, was known. There was about 22 other plant genomes known at the time, but these were things like wheat and cotton and, and, and soybean, et cetera. Cannabis was, was really a, a medicine, and it's, it's a genome that's pretty standard. It's about 820 megabase pairs, so not, not huge, but relatively complex, and um, we, we actually sequenced um, a, a cultivar, or what we were in the day calling a strain called Purple Kush, that we, we obtained the, the leaves for the, the sequencing from a medical cannabis patient in Vancouver, British Columbia, who was growing it for himself. So it wasn't you know, a big sort of corporate enterprise at the time, and he gave or donated a handful of leaves that we isolated the DNA from. So that has been an extremely successful project. At the same time, it's, it's, it's very incomplete. The genome is fragmented. It gave people the raw materials to, to do further analyses, but it's certainly not finished. But in, in today's talk, I'm gonna highlight a couple of areas that we've actually, what we've used the genome for. And I guess where I'm trying to go here is that, you know, sequencing a genome is one thing. You churn out a bunch of data, you make it available, you, you do a lot of computational work, um, but it, it, it's really the raw materials for other science. So one of the things, the Q1, question number one, that we um, tackled both with the genome and, and before that was trying to figure out how cannabinoids and terpenes are formed in the plant. So this is, you know, how does THC acid or cannabidiolic acid or myrcene or beta caryophylline on the terpene side, how are they actually made? What are the genes that control their production? And the way we did that was, was actually twofold. One of them was, uh, one approach was to, to focus in on the plant structures that make cannabinoids. So these are the glandular trichomes that are found on the female floral tissue. So female flowers are the bud, the, the flower that you know, you'll smoke or extract. They're rich in cannabinoids. And the reason they're rich in cannabinoids is because cannabinoids are not just made in leaves or in green material, they're actually made in these little disks of cells that are underlying a resin droplet on the top of a trichome. A trichome is like a microscopic hair. I mean, you can see it with your eyes, but it looks like a little bit of a sort of shiny, crystal-y thing on a plant surface. We took those, those cell types, those specific cell types of trichomes, 
and analyze the gene expression in them using DNA sequencing technology that was available in the day. And we were able, together with a lot of classical biochemistry, a lot of you know, the sort of grunt work that grad students are in, in the lab at midnight doing, um, to really figure out all of the enzymes and the genes that encode those enzymes that are present in the cannabis genome. So we, from the sort of basic building blocks of plant metabolism down to the finished end products that an audience like attending CanMed here is interested in, things like cannabidiolic acid, which is the precursor to CBD. Um, now we know how those are formed. And that was really the power of genomics. The, in, in particular, cannabichromic acid, CBCA, which is on the bottom right of the, of the slide there, um, we actually didn't look at the trichomes. We analyzed the genome in its entirety to find that enzyme. So that was one sort of success story. We similarly, and I've heard that voice of, of, of t the time limit, the voice of God so many times, I actually dropped slides from my talk today. Um, but similarly, we've done biochemical work using the purple kush genome to figure out how the terpenes, for which cannabis is well known as well, how the terpenes are formed, what are the enzymes that make terpenes. And we ended up having basically all of the metabolites that are labeled on that slide, though the major cannabinoids like cannabidiolic acid, cannabigerolic acid, THC acid, cannabichromic acid, and the major monoterpenes, and these are the compounds that Ethan Russo was talking about as well, things like beta caryophylline and myrcene and pinene, we have all of those enzymes, and that's from genomics. The other thing we did with our genome is, is moved away from the biochemistry for which my lab was sort of established and really focused on the evolution of the plant. What is the gene genetic structure of cannabis? And by genetic structure, I mean what are the relationships amongst all these different types of cannabis that we have? So we know that drug type cannabis and hemp are different. I heard various conversations around CBD from hemp and CBD from cannabis. It's the same plant, it's the same species. They're interfertile, so cannabis, the drug form, whether it's called marijuana or cannabis or drug type cannabis, and hemp are grown and, and re really bred for different purposes. So hemp is the source of those seeds and fiber for which um, I sort of showed in the first slide, while marijuana or drug type cannabis is for the production of cannabinoids like THC and CBD. But they're very, they're very similar sort of morphologically. Um, certainly um, hemp is a lot more sort of scraggly looking plant if you drive past the hemp field and we have about 100,000 acres of hemp grown in Canada each year, it's not as sort of pristine, beautiful crop like you see in a modern medical cannabis production system, but they're the same plant. Within drug type cannabis, of course, we have this sort of, you know, this canonical classification, which I actually think is, is, is probably not that meaningful, but the classification is that drug type cannabis is divided into indica style plants or type plants and sativa type plants. Indica type plants would be sort of shorter, stockier, broader leaflets and with a more of a sedative or sort of body stone versus sativa, a taller, sort of lankier, more open flowering plant, narrower leaflets and with a sort of stimulating or cerebral effect. And this is what, you know, whether you're in a dispensary in Vancouver where I'm from or going online in California or wherever you are, people classify drug type cannabis, marijuana type cannabis in, into these types and they also describe a third type, the hybrid, the mix of the two. So that, that's sort of how we think about cannabis broadly. And then of course we have this kind of, this crazy chaotic world of cannabis strains or cultivars or chemovars White Widow, Sour Diesel, Jack Herrera, Chem Dog, what have you. These, are, these have been sort of, I would say, haphazardly named in many cases um, by the people who sprouted the seed or got a clone from their buddy and really enjoyed and gave it a new name. So what we tried to do with our genomics work 
was use genotyping, that is the ability to sort of analyze the, the genetic differences between organisms using a, a, a scan sequencing technique. So we didn't sequence every single piece of DNA in, in the plants. We, we scanned just sort of the, the sort of high points. And we got 43 samples of, of DNA from, from hemp types and 81 drug type or marijuana type samples. And we analyzed them using a, a technology called genotyping by sequencing. And what this gave us was a data set of about 14,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. These would be individual genetic DNA code differences between those samples. And this was in, when I say we, this was in collaboration with a, a population geneticist at Dalhousie University named Sean Miles. And then we crunch that data. Then it really, the problem moves away from a plant problem or a DNA sequencing problem into a statistical problem. And, and what we used was, a, or at least as we visualized the data, here shown as a pr principal component analysis, we found that there was one group, that sort of upper right-hand group in green, that was the hemp type. They were very broadly separated from drug-type cannabis which suggests, again, you know, they backs up what we already know. They're grown for different purposes. They might have even originated from different sort of gene pools. But within the drug type, we found some relationships, but it was, it was, a, it was sort of a larger, more spread out group. And then when we dug in more closely, what we were trying to do was correlate what we called the, the reported ancestry, so the percentage of indica or percentage of sativa, as described by the grower or the seed company that provided the, the sample with what the genetic type said. And the R-squared, the correlation between reported ancestry and genotype was 0.36. So it's a it, you know, low to moderate correlation. In other words, there wasn't a lot of evidence to support genetic differences between indicas and sativas as they were described by the people who grow those plants. So I think what we're, what we're sort of exposing here is, uh, you know, the inaccuracy of that indica sativa dichotomy. But what I don't suggest is that it doesn't mean there's the, there subject, not subjective differences between cannabis types. People clearly see that, whether it's medical or recreational use, and there are more sedative types and more stimulating types, but it's just that the genetic identity and then the, also the ability of the grower, the processor, the dispensary, to give you information around that is not, not really on firm footing. So I'll go back one slide. What's next for cannabis genomics? I think what we're gonna see now is a movement towards using genomics to fast track breeding. We've had this you know, wonderful plant it's widely grown, probably every continent. I'm not sure about Antarctica, but I'm sure someone has tried to, to cultivate it there. Um, but it's been really kept out of labs, you know, in universities, governments, larger corporations. Its improvement has been limited to the sort of underground breeding world, which has, has to be applauded for its, you know, its amazing success in increasing THC levels and bringing CBD back. But it hasn't solved some of the problems, things like you know, powdery mildew is a widespread uh, fungal pathogen. Outdoors continues to be challenging in different latitudes. Really what we need is a genomics to accelerate crop improvement. And so I just, just to finish my talk, I, I, I sort of highlight three areas where I think this kind of new wave of cannabis science driven by genomics is going to to, to move things along for our, both our industry and for the use of cannabis. One is, it's a potential resolution for this strain chaos problem in the sense that, you know, we need trust in the industry, we need more predictable effects for patients and consumers, we need a better understanding at a purely scientific level of how cannabis evolved. So I think by applying more genetics, getting more samples, doing more in-depth analyses, we're, we're probably gonna be able to link you know, a, a name, and I think humans are always going to want a name. They're not going to want a list of chemicals. They're going to want a name. You know, whether we have Merlot grapes and we have Honeycrisp apples and we have Dalmatian dogs and we name those things. And I think we're going to continue to name cannabis, but we need some genetic identity that backs that up. As I mentioned before, genetic markers are going to accelerate breeding, things like flowering traits, disease-resistant traits, specialized chemistries. I heard THCV 
mentioned earlier, CBG. I mean, we, we want to drive towards breeding and providing plants that have chemistry that helps patients. Also has recreational properties that are desirable. Three minutes. It, the last point, and I think, you know, this is already being worked on in the industry, is that, you know, we, we have sort of generally sort of two tools or have had two tools in, in plant improvement. One is traditional breeding. The other is genetic modification. Now we have a sort of a third way, which is genome editing. That's using specialized and revolutionary techniques called CRISPR-Cas and related um, approaches to actually make changes in genomes, whether it's an animal genome or a plant genome, towards a desirable outcome. And I think, you know, now cannabis is finally sort of coming out of the closet as, a, as an organism that, that labs can work on. We will see the application of this technology fairly soon. Is it GMO or not? I mean, the EU says one thing and North America says something else, so it's a bit of a debate, but uh, I think this is coming as well. And with that, I'll end, and if there's time for questions, I'll take some. Thanks. There's microphones for questions in the front of the room. Please step up. If you have a question, I think you need to go to the mic at the... Hi, John. Thanks for coming today. Um, I wanted to find out um, more specifically what kind of uh, uh, markers, what loci you are uh, beginning to um, find uh, disease resistance, for instance, and um, possibly the uh, um, auto flowering traits. One minute. Yeah, so, you know, I partly now a lot of my work is more of a commercial nature, so I'm, I'm sort of a bit hesitant to, other than to say, you know, flowering time control is a key area that we're dissecting in, in our work, and disease resistance, specifically around botrytis and powdery mildew, I think are huge drivers of, of, of crop, maybe not loss, but loss of value. Um, so we're working on those two as well. I just want to know, is it GMO or not? Actually, there's no GMO, uh, I mean, like, like in terms of CRISPR, I don't think it's GMO because the changes made, those genome editing technique, is the same thing that would happen naturally with, with mutation or you could induce it with a chemical or radiation. So I think it's safe to say it's not GMO. In terms of the idea that we have GMO cannabis already, there's no GMO cannabis, I mean, it may exist in a lab, but it's not something that's, that's out in the, in the wild in terms of production or anything. So I don't think we have to worry about that yet. 